Testing, yes. Hello, hello. Um, take a seat. There's plenty of seats the further you get to the front of the room. Tell your friends in the hallway uh, that we're starting in a minute. All right, uh, welcome everybody to uh, the IETF 118 plenary. Uh, my name is Lars Eckert, I'm the IETF chair, and um, we still don't believe in uh, King's presidents and voting, but apparently we're kind of okay with massive stages that are sort of really high up. And I, I, don't, I don't think I've had a view of the room like this in a long time, and I've been on too many of these. So uh, let's see what we find in Brisbane. Um, this is the note well that you've seen many times. Um, this is a session at the ITF. the note well applies. Um, there are uh, various uh, policies in effect about uh, IPR and the need to disclose your knowledge of it if you participate in a discussion that touches upon it. Um, you uh, agree to follow that rule and all other rules and policies on that uh, eye chart slide. Um, most of all, um, we're gonna especially tonight if you go to a microphone, take a video of you, there's a photography here. Um, if you wear a white lanyard, that means you're okay with having your photo taken. If you're not okay, go outside and grab a red one. Uh, Richard's really good at respecting that. Um, personal information that you provide to us, we will handle with the utmost care according to all uh, policies that are uh, relevant to that. Um, and you agree to work respectfully with one another. And so far this week, I think that has worked reasonably well as far as I know. So thank you very much for that. Keep it going for this meeting and all future meetings and all interactions on the IETF. Um, be nice to each other. If you're joining us online, um, there's some, some tips on the slide for you. Um, your audio will be off and also your video will be off. So no need to get dressed or anything like that. Um, when, you're, when you're joining the queue, uh, Get ready to, uh, uh, when you're recognized, unmute yourself. Uh, and if you have, have the ability to be dressed at that point and send us video, uh, we would appreciate seeing you and not just hearing you, but that's optional. And if you have a headset, uh, use it. Or if you're reasonably sure your audio setup works, you know, try that. And there's more details on the link below. Um, also in the room, I don't know what's on the next slide, so I'm gonna say it now. Um, use the online uh, on-site tool um, to get in queue. Um, scan the QR code uh, that you see up there. Um, you should be familiar with how this works um, and uh, use that. Um, there's a chat um, which is um, available to you if you get too bored during this initial uh, part of the presentation. Uh, be nice to each other also in the chat. Um, this is our agenda. You notice we don't have the usual plaque handover clapping, thanking the host thing. That's because unfortunately we don't have a host for this meeting. Um, this is, no, Colin. <laughs> we don't have, a, so, so Cisco has hosted many meetings. This is not one of them. Uh, so if you want to get a, applause for Cisco, you should have uh, <laughs> got out the checkbook earlier. Um, so so um, therefore we also have, don't have nice things like t-shirts, but the LLC has tried to provide other nice things like coffee. But if you're wondering why is there no t-shirts, it's because we don't have anybody who pays for them and t-shirts are expensive. But we have uh, store.itf.org, which sort of soft launched, I guess, with this meeting. And you can buy the semi-official t-shirt of this meeting and I guess a bunch of other t-shirts that have ITF stuff on them. And we're sort of trying to figure out what um, merchandise um, we might be able to overcharge you for. And so if you want anything with a logo on it, uh, to support the ITF, um, that's, the, the prices are not uh, just recovering costs. You're also supporting the ITF if you buy something at the store. So tell us what you want to buy. We'll gladly put a logo on it and you can buy as many as you want for all your friends. Christmas is coming, by the way. Just saying, <laughs> I, you know, your partners have probably heard all about these acronyms and now you can get them t-shirts that have these acronyms on them. I mean... Just imagine the look, you know, 
don't you just want to try it out just for the look? You do want to, right? I'm just kidding. Anyhow, so we have a, we have a slight. I can ramble a little bit since we have a little extra time because no hosts. Um, agenda is longer than I thought. Uh, we so I try to do. We have two hours. I'm going to try to do the first part in one hour, uh, so that we have an hour combined for open meeting for open mic at least. Um, I hope that's going to work out. Um, thank you, as always, to everybody who made the meeting happen, not just this meeting here, but the meeting week. That includes the secretariat. That's awesome, as always. The Meet Echo team, uh, we are using a very uh, nicely updated new Meet Echo client this week, which I heard a lot of good things about. So thanks for that. I was always complaining about the UI. You've now fixed the UI. Thank you. Um, the NOC has provided a great network, as always. Um, the LLC is doing things behind the scenes. Uh, as does the trust, the tools team uh, has been busy fixing various bugs at the last second, so thank you for that. And we had great support for the hackathon on the weekend. Thank you. So that gets me to the ISG uh, report and chair report, um, which go over the usual participant statistics for this meeting that in the grand edition of these things I haven't seen yet. Um, and some other uh, items of interest. So we had uh, 1,700 registrations, 1,748. That includes 1,060 on-site. So excellent. That's, I think, the biggest on-site we had uh, since COVID. And I think also the 688 remote is the highest number we've seen since COVID. And also, I think, during COVID, we, that was still pretty high up there. So, so a big meeting, as, as usual, when we go to Europe, and usually when we go to Prague, so well done. Um, 351 uh, fee waivers were granted. Almost all of them were used. Those were the remote fee waivers. Um, Colin and I have a very small number of in-person fee waivers that we're uh, giving out. I think each of us has 10, if I remember correctly. Somehow I managed to give out 12. Don't ask me how that happened. Uh, but two of you were very lucky. Um, and uh, Colin has stuck to his allotted limit. And we got a few more requests. And, and some of them, you know, we uh, decided not to grant for various reasons. And we had a very substantial hackathon uh, presence again on the weekend. If you were here for that, and I guess many of you were, uh, that seems to be still one of the draws of this week. Uh, and we're going to post final stats later. Um, the breakdown between on-site and remote um, is surprisingly symmetric in the big colors this time. Um, others and, and USA leading Taiwan is pretty big there. Then China, nice. Um, seems, the, the, it seems like the usual global spread uh, as adjusted for a European location. Uh, meeting registrations over time, this includes um, the, all the meetings that we had post-COVID. The dark blue is people on site, the light blue is people remote. And you can see that um, it is the biggest meeting we've had uh, since we came out of COVID, uh, both in terms of on site and in terms of um, remote, except for that Vienna meeting, which I would count still kind of as a special event because it was the first one. Um, so that, that is very good. I, I do hope we see lots of people um, in Brisbane and then in, in later meetings on site and remote as well. Um, ISG statements are always a great source of interest to the community. Uh, we keep trying to provide them to you for your diligent review. Um, We've uh, updated one on in-person and online interim meetings. Uh, we also did one on support documents in ITF working groups. Both of those, I think, were updates of existing ones. Um, we did one that I have later slides on, which was to uh, merge parts of the art and transport areas. Um, and I'm going to say a few more words of that. And then we did one on the results of that community consultation. Uh, we had an appeal on uh, the revised statement on the earlier slide um, that uh, the ISG rejected. And as far as I understand it, it's now uh, raised again with the IAB and they are deliberating it. Um, and there's more reports uh, from the IAB, the LLC board, Secretariat and IANA at that URL. And there is a blog, um, which is not run by the IESG, but it's an ITF activity that's in my deck. So if you want to write a blog about something you're doing in the IETF or your group is doing that you think is of broader interest, talk to Greg. Greg, where are you? Greg's here. He's always very happy to have authors, guest authors for the blog posts. Um, we have childcare again. Um, 
this is now, we've been doing this ever since COVID, I want to say. And we, we keep doing it in the foreseeable future. So if you have children and it would help you if you could bring them along, if it would help you to attend in person, please do so. I think we had 10 kids this time and I, I get really good feedback. We all got really good feedback, both about the nannies and about the, of, that this program being offered. It's supported by um, a sponsorship category that, that a lot of companies are graciously supporting. Um, it, it really helps the people um, that uh, have kids at that age um, that allows them to come and participate in person. So this is a, this is a great um, event. No, it's not an event, it's a program. Um, the WIT area, I alluded to this earlier. This is um, a merger, the, the W comes from web and the IT comes from internet transport. Um, what we're doing is, um, the, the IHG has sort of done a trend analysis of what's happening in terms of the growth of various areas. And art has always been, or for a while, has been the largest by far. And also, if you look at where do boffs happen and where does new work start, it's typically art and sec that have the strongest uh, 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 attractor for new work at the moment. Um, and that became a problem. Art already has had two 80s now. We, we added a third. But looking at the curve, we could almost justify a fourth, and that felt a little unbalanced. And art is also, because of that growth, uh, spreading out into quite a few topic areas. And so as part of the retreat uh, we did earlier in the year, we sat down and figured out, is there something we can do in terms of restructuring how the work is organized in the IHF? So it doesn't change the content of what you're doing in the working groups. This is just basically giving you giving your area a new label or putting you potentially into a new area. So the, the web-related pieces of art are going to move to WIT, and the internet transport related pieces of transport are going to move to WIT, the transport area will close. This is what this slide is saying. In more detail, um, the green uh, acronyms on this slide are the groups out of art that are going to move into WIT, and the red ones are the ones from transport that are moving into WIT in the first bullet. There's some other um, working groups out of um, transport, ALTO and IBBM, that are going to move to OPS, and I think one of them might also close. DTN is going to move to INT and a few areas in art that are security related and already, I think, have uh, responsible air directors from security are moving to SEC. So that was outlined in uh, these uh, emails I pointed to earlier. We got a bunch of feedback. Uh, most of it was in favor. I think we talked about it at least at TSV area this week. I don't know if it was talked about in art area yet or will be. I'm seeing it was or will be. Uh, thumbs up, okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead with this uh, timeline-wise. Nope, no slide on the timeline. Timeline is um, before Brisbane. So we're probably going to, um, before we start um, the agenda planning process for Brisbane, do this reshuffling where the WIT area exists and, and, and the working groups are in it so we can properly deconflict. And so as you go into Brisbane, you will no longer see transport sessions. We already have the last transport area dinner this week, so it's done. Um, so, so keep that in mind if you're wondering why is my area name different? It's because of this. Um, this was a slide I was going to update as a reminder to myself, but uh, you can see it now too. So we're doing the Friday experiment this week, which is we're basically, because there's so much pressure for session time um, that we had to do... Um, that we have to sort of satisfy somehow. And the experiment in Prague was to treat Friday as a full day and schedule sessions Friday afternoon. And um, we decided we're gonna already now, uh, before the results are in, decide we're also gonna do it in Brisbane so that you can all book your flights correctly. Um, that is sort of the most important consideration. Also, it turns out we probably want data for more than one ITF meeting before we make a final decision. So for Brisbane, you can, you can book your travel under the assumption that Friday is a full day ending at five-ish, I think. Right, and that brings us to keep Ukraine connected. Um, so we're in Prague, and this is a, um, a group of people uh, that uh, has quite a few ITFers involved that basically have been collecting um, equipment um, from, from various parts and uh, sending it to Ukraine to keep them on the internet. And Jan is going to say a few words about that effort. Thank you, Lars. Uh, my name is Jan George. I'm from Global Nog Alliance and Six Connect. Uh, I have a few minutes to tell you about this stuff. So many moons ago, we started the Global Nog Alliance. Uh, that's a not-for-profit organization to help network operators group around the world. 
And uh, this is our motto. Uh, next slide, please. I can press. Okay. Okay. This is our motto. Our IT tech community is one big family. We don't think in colors. We don't think in races or genders. We, we don't think in borders. And we try to be as neutral and non-political as possible. And um, after that, the conflict in U Ukraine started. And we started receiving images like this. See, people in the trenches trying to connect fiber together to keep people connected to the internet. Um, and we thought that it would be nice to help keeping people in Ukraine connected to the internet and have access to the information. So we started uh, the Keep Ukraine Connected Task Force under the Global Nog Alliance. Um, and this is a not political neutral project uh, that is aimed solely to help operators keep people connected. And it is based on the premise that is from the operators for the operators. Um, as you see, the working conditions here, is, here are not great, so I will never again complain about my working conditions. Yeah. So then we, we asked the wider internet operators community to donate equipment that they don't need if you do the technology refresh on your network and you don't need routers, switches, servers, and that stuff uh, to send it to us. And we have volunteers that uh, load this equipment on the trucks and vans and drive them into the Ukraine to hand them over to the operators that need equipment to rebuild uh, the network. Uh, and the reaction was amazing. Uh, if you participated in this project and are in this room, thank you very much. Um, it, was, it was really, really, really helpful uh, because uh, we managed to, to gather a lot of stuff. Uh, so for the equipment that we sent, you have the numbers there, I will not read them all. But uh, one of the most important one is fiber splicers because they need to connect the fiber together in the trenches. Uh, and we managed to ship uh, 41 fiber splicers. This is quite expensive. This is where the money donation went mostly to buy the fiber splicers uh, to send them there. Uh, also 490 access points to install in the shelters when the bombing is happening, when bombs are coming down, so people can still be connected when they lose the mobile signal and talk to their families and say that they are, they are, they are, they are still alive. Um, yeah, we shift there nowadays probably around $3 million worth of equipment, and uh, Ukrainian operators are very, very happy and, uh, for this um, help. Um, we are also helping Sudanese people a little bit right now because there is a conflict there. Uh, we are doing some stuff for them. Uh, and we are also reflecting about other situations around the world. Uh, but our resources are very limited as this is a completely voluntary work. And it's just a bunch of us that are coordinating this stuff. And uh, if you can help in any reasonable way, uh, contact us come to us and uh, we will try to also help other places around the world uh, to receive the same sort of help like Ukrainians did because we thought that uh, this would be a good blueprint uh, to also help in cases of other uh, disasters, conflicts, uh, civil unrests and so on. So if you're interested in this, please come to talk to us. Here is the the information and thank you. Thanks, Jan. And that brings us to the IAV presentation. And I think Jan is sort of sitting up here in the corner if you want to give your textbook to him later. Thank you. My name is Mike Rubin. I'm the chair of the IAV. And as always, I want to give you a very brief update about what we did since the last meeting. There is more extended uh, information in the report, which is in the proceedings. You can read all that. This slide just shows a couple of highlights if you're interested in it. So we have a new IAB program, the e-impact program. The program met uh, yesterday lunchtime already, but there's also mailing list that you can sign up for if you are interested in this. 
Um, I mentioned last time I was standing here, I was mentioning also that we sometimes write statements to give input to things that actually happen outside the IETF but might impact what we're doing here. So we published one of those statements again. And then just to give an example about outreach activities, we also had a session at IGF last month where we were like showing what the IETF is doing and providing visibility about our work. And this one, I really would like to take the opportunity that I'm standing here to make you aware of a workshop we are planning. The workshop will take place in January um, and will be online, but we are looking for input from you. So if you would like to participate in the workshop, you have to send us a position, position paper. We need these position papers in order to create our agenda and figure out what we want to talk about. This workshop is about barriers to internet access of services. So kind of what we want to, want to figure out is actually what, what does the internet actually means to the user? What do you need to actually use the internet? What are barriers in terms of blocking and filtering or other limitations that where you can't use all the protocols and all the stuff we're developing here? And we really would like to collect information about this, reports, measurement data, and then have a discussion about it. And then this is also a good opportunity to say thank you to a couple of people who support our work. In this case, I would like to uh, introduce that we have a new liaison manager for ITUT SG15, that's Deborah. Deborah, thank you for serving. And at the same time, also thank you to John who served in this position previously. And then also the second point, uh, I don't have a picture here for the second point on the slide because it's a little bit something inside the IAB, but I would anyway like to take the opportunity um, to mention it here. So we have a new liaison from ISOP, who is Sally Wentworth. But I also would like to say a big thank you to Karen, who served in this position for many, many years on the IAB. And we were re really glad to have you. I hope you're here. Where are you? There are you. Little applause for you. Thank you. And then the third point here is about uh, also something, person who is on the IAB, so you know his face, his, his face maybe. So Dhruv is uh, serving as uh, outreach coordinator now. This is a new position we have on the IAB in order to be a little bit more coordinated about outreach. Um, and if you have any questions about outreach, and this is coordination about outreach of leadership when we go outside and talk about the ITF. So if you want to know anything about this, then talk to Dhruv. And uh, lastly, please watch out very soon we will start the call for candidates for the ISOC Board of Trustees. That's a very important position and we are really looking for candidates. We this, this time have two people to fill the seats. Uh, please nominate people, please nominate yourself and then also later on provide feedback in the process. That's coming very soon, probably next week. That's actually mostly my report. We had a couple of other related meetings this week. We had also the EDM program meeting on Monday. Uh, we had the IB open meeting yesterday, and we have office hours for the liaison coordinators tomorrow. So, you know, plenty of opportunities to talk to us or just send us an email, talk to me directly, whatever. Yeah, hope, hope to get input from you. Thank you. That brings us to Colin with the internet research task force. I'm trying to like bridge the gap here, I'm failing. <laughs> you could speed up a little bit, that would be helpful. <laughs> you, were so, you were so good earlier, we yeah. went, went more ad-lib remarks last. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm Colin Parkins, this is the IRTF report. So as uh, many of you will know, um, in addition to the research groups, the IRTF, uh, in conjunction with the, the Internet Society, uh, the slide seems to have disappeared, um, organizes the um, Applied Networking uh, Research Prize. Um, the ANRP is awarded to... Um, can you sneak in, Cindy? Clearly, you shouldn't let a researcher near a, a laptop. Too many slides. There we go. 
Let's see if I can do this without breaking it for the rest of the time. Um, the Applied Networking Research Prize is awarded to recognize some of the best, research, best recent results in applied networking research. It's awarded to recognize um, interesting new research ideas with potential to uh, have relevance to the standards community. And it's awarded to recognize upcoming people that are likely to have an impact in this community. Very carefully. Um, I'm very pleased to announce that uh, we will be awarding three uh, ANRP prizes this time. Uh, the first is to uh, Shiva Karkala, um, who will be talking about his work on verifying the correctness of name servers. Uh, this talk, uh, some of you will remember, was uh, originally scheduled for the San Francisco meeting, uh, but has to be postponed because of illness, uh, and uh, so will be happening this time instead. Uh, we also have talks by uh, Dennis Trautwein uh, and uh, Ramakrishnan uh, Sundar Raman. Um, Dennis will be talking about uh, IPFS and content addressable peer-to-peer -peer storage. Uh, Rama will be talking about his work on uh, uh, identifying and locating in-network uh, censorship devices. The papers and the slides are on the IRTF website. I think we've got three fantastic talks tomorrow, um, so please do come along, and, and congratulations to all the winners. The ANRP uh, relies on your nominations. Um, the reason we have uh, such a successful um, set of talks and a fantastic set of talks over the years is because people nominate the papers. So if you know of any uh, people, any papers, any work which, which you believe are worthy of a nomination for the ANRP uh, for 2024, the nomination deadline is the 19th of November, uh, end of next week. So please do go to the website, uh, make your nominations, uh, encourage people to self-nominate if you know of good work. Um, without the nominations, we, we won't have these fantastic talks going forward. And finally, uh, before I finish, I also want to mention the Applied Networking Research Workshop. The 2024 version of this workshop will take place co-locating with uh, the Vancouver IETF in July uh, next year. The chairs will be Simone Ferlin from Red Hat, uh, Ignacio Castro from Queen Mary, University of London. Uh, let's see him, he's, I'm sure he's here somewhere. Ignacio uh, is, is at the ITF uh, this week, uh, right at the back over there. Uh, so if you have questions about the ANR, ANRW, please, please find him in the hallways. Uh, look out for the call for papers in uh, early 2024. Thank you. Next is the number. So hello, um, uh, Martin Thompson, the NOMCOM chair this year. Uh, the ITF is weird in that every year we take a random bunch of 10 people and ask, put the fate of the organization in their hands. Um, this is those 10 people. Uh, we should be very grateful that they are excellent and reasonable and are taking the job very, very seriously. So um, if you get the opportunity, uh, thank them, give them feedback, and uh, keep them happy because they're working very, very hard right now. And we also have a number of liaisons that have been excellent help in, in helping us do the, the difficult work of, of choosing who it is that will lead this organization in, in the next couple of years. We had something of an exceptional turnout this year. We had uh, everyone wanting to be on the IAB. Uh, and we also found that uh, there were a number of excellent candidates here for, uh, or I should say nominees, for uh, the ITF LLC board, the trust, and various area director positions. Had something of a little bit of a churn. The IESG report talked about the movement of areas that disrupted our operations somewhat. Uh, we now have to fill two art positions and no transport positions. And uh, we have the honor of uh, filling the ITF chair position as well. Uh, and I'd like to thank everyone involved for making that process very, very smooth. Um, and, and in particular, uh, Lars has been a great help on that one. Uh, this week, we've been going through the process of interviewing all these wonderful people who have accepted nominations. 
And uh, we, uh, most of the way through those interviews, thank you to everyone who has uh, dedicated some time away from the work that they're doing and coming and talking to us, uh, including those who have provided some excellent feedback on those people. Uh, I think we, we, we hope that we will make some decisions soon and we'll be able to let people know the conclusions to those things next year. Uh, that sounds a bit odd, but there's confirmations and a bunch of other things we need to do. So uh, feedback is still open, but we will be closing that feedback at midday on Friday. Uh, we may extend that if we find we don't have enough feedback, but thus far uh, the database has well over 900 pieces of feedback sitting in there. And uh, we are probably more concerned about being able to read all of it than uh, the fact that there is a lack of it. So um, thank you, everyone. And uh, back to Lars. Thank you, Martin, and, and all the NOMCOM uh, participants. It's, it's a critical role, and, and you're doing an excellent job. Um, Jay and or Jason with the LLC. Sorry, well, I just recovered from coughing fit. Um, hello, um, I'm Jay Daly. I'm the IETF Executive Director. Uh, nice to see you all again. Thank you for coming. Um, thank you all for um, making this such a large meeting. Lovely. Um, so we're going to start off with our, um, our gold sponsors. Um, uh, as I think you know, we have this values-based sponsorship program. Um, <clears throat> where we have diversity and inclusion, running code and sustainability as um, three separate areas of values that people support us on. Um, diversity and inclusion, as we know, pays for such things as fee waivers and child care and other things. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I think, yeah. Um, the, the running code um, for the hackathon and other things like that. And the sustainability is going to be paying for our carbon offsets and we're also moving very shortly away, hopefully, from plastic bottles and uh, possibly away from plastic badges and other things and using the money to do that with. Um, so these people are very important to us. It's a, a, a very significant commitment. And um, it is helping us to you know, just make that kind of transformation of the meeting process that is not um, related to directly to the standard side of things, but is an important part of the modernization and change of any organization. Um, so also on the, the same set of things, the same set of diversity things, as well as the gold sponsors, we have a set of um, silver and bronze sponsors. So um, if I could just have a little round of applause for all of these sponsors. Thank you very much for... Um, <clears throat> thank, thank you very much for your contributions. Um, we also have a number of people who support us with equipment services and connectivity. Um, this is, uh, there are a number of people on here who have actually been supporting us for some years and haven't really been properly recognised before. Um, so ISOD, who um, provide us the um, IMAP server that we use, for example. Um, these people just give us their services. It's very generous of them. And many of them do it just on a, on a very, very friendly, straightforward basis. Um, no contracts involved, no anything. It's, um, it's lovely of those people. So once again, thank you to these people for their ongoing support of the IETF. <laughs> I know this is the bit you all love, the clapping. Thank you very much. Um, so we now have a, an online store. So far, we are only selling T-shirts on there. We will, of course, you know, expand into mugs, um, stickers, various other things over time. Um, uh, as uh, Lars mentioned, we don't have a host for this meeting, so there are no free T-shirts, but you can buy the T-shirt for those of you that need to maintain the set. Um, and for those previous T-shirts where we are own the rights or we have the rights to sell them, we either have those there or beginning to add those onto the um, store as well. If there are any other good ideas of things that you think that we could sell, then please tell Greg. I'm sure he'd love to hear of all those ideas. That'd be great. Um, we don't make a lot of money off this. I think we did um, uh, 
roughly $20,000 worth of sales at some point, or sorry, $5,000 worth of sales and made $20 out of it. So it's not meant to be us trying to make the money out of it. It's meant to be so that you can get the things that then go out and represent the ITF and that sort of stuff afterwards. Um, so there are uh, lots of volunteers, um, as we know, you're volunteers here, but we have a number of specific sessions where volunteers directly contribute to the um, running of the, um, either of the tools or of the, um, the network during the, the week. So we have the code sprint volunteers who come on Saturday and who work on data tracker and who write new things for data tracker. And then we have the NOC who um, run the, the much of the NOC throughout the week for us. Um, so um, thank you to these people and thank you also to their employers who um, support them coming and have supported many of them coming for some years. That's very good for you. Thank you. Um, there are um, a, a number of staff around um, as well uh, working on things. So we have the Secretariat staff. Um, uh, as I'm sure you know, some of these people in the Secretariat, Secretariat staff have been here longer than many of us have been coming. Um, we have the MeTECO team, um, and as we've seen, as Lars has mentioned, uh, they, you know, they continue to invest in it, continue to develop it, and so we have a, um, a, a much better tool now. Um, we have the t um, some tools contractors, and then we have the, um, the contracted NOC staff as well, who, um, I don't know if you know, but they work for a number of other standards development organisations, and so they have expertise in doing this in various other places. And I'm sure this is the one that they like doing best, you know, definitely. Um, so thank you again to all of those people. Um, uh, then you have us staff. Um, so uh, as I'm sure many of you are worried about, yes, we're growing the empire. This is going to be, you know, 10 times this within the year. No, we are very slowly adding on um, technical people, largely developers. Um, and... Um, that seems to be, you know, our, our particular um, uh, need uh, in the future. So moving forwards. Um, so uh, obviously I'm on there, but if you could clap the others on there, that would be lovely. Thank you very much. You know. Um, and then so finally, thank you to our global hosts and global supporters. So these are the people who make a long-term commitment to the IETF. Um, to fund us and to host our meetings. Um, these are the people who go out of their way to help introduce us to other sponsors, um, to help us um, get access to, say, resources within their organization that might understand diversity and inclusion, and you know, who, who are using their money, um, sorry, trusting us with their money to deliver a, a better meeting experience for all of you. So um, thank you very much to the uh, global hosts and global supporters. Uh, so ITF 119 will be in Brisbane um, on, from March the 16th to the March the 22nd. Um, I am right, reliably informed the monsoons will finish on March the 15th, um, so, but it will be very warm. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely city, Brisbane, if you've never been to. It has a, a lovely waterfront. It's all been redeveloped. It's um, just got a nice um, modern feel to it. It's, it's friendly. It is um, Oceania, so all of the coffee is good. You do not have to search around trying to find specialist coffee. Um, uh, I know it's a long way, but it's actually very cheap um, hotel rooms, which will, we think will substantially offset the cost, uh, extra cost of flights um, for most of you, which is like a little plea um, for you all to come along to that meeting. Um, We'll be opening uh, registration soon after this meeting. We'll give you some idea of those room costs as well. Um, we think this is going to be a great meeting. We um, haven't yet quite signed the meeting host, but we're in negotiations with people, so it won't be too long, we hope, before that is arranged. Um, and we have at least one ITFer who lives locally who has an outstanding motorbike collection and has promised to try and bring some of those along. So um, definitely this is a meeting to come to. So here's our list of um, future meetings. Um, 119 is in Brisbane. Um, 120, uh, as we know, is in Vancouver. And um, Huawei will be uh, the host for that one. 121 is in Dublin. And we've just announced Cisco as the host for that meeting. Thank you very much, Cisco. 
that is going to be a fantastic meeting as well. Um, Bangkok, which is one of the rearranged meetings, um, and as, which is probably why you think that we've been to Bangkok at least 10 times, but it's mainly that we've rearranged it twice um, to, to move to this one. We have Madrid, which is a, um, another rearranged meeting. Um, we should have a host sorted for that, but it's just a little bit far out to sign yeah. the contract. And then we're working on 124 North America and 125 Asia. And then we're back to Vienna because those of us who were there enjoyed it so much, we thought the rest of you should come too and enjoy it. So um, we'll be going there. Right, um, that's it for me. Thank you. Over to Jason. <laughs> All right, thanks very much, everybody. Um, let's see here. Um, so these are the folks that are currently serving on the board. I think you probably know all of us. Um, and uh, I think everyone but Maya is here. Um, Maya's remote. Um, there, in fact, there she is. Hello, hi. Um, so what are things that we've been working on lately? Um, first, the timeliness and accuracy of financial statements. So thankfully, our new um, part-time director of finance, Debbie, has helped us here tremendously. Um, what we ended up having a problem with before was our monthly statements would come several months after we expected them in some cases, and they were sort of riddled with errors um, that we would have to go back and correct, and uh, that took a lot of time, and Debbie has magically solved all that stuff um, for us, and things are really, um, really cracking now, which is great. So that is um, you know, basically complete at this point. We continue to focus on fundraising. Um, that's uh, certainly important to us. These are everything from small donors um, to very large donors um, to help fund operations. And that's a continuing focus that um, is going to follow through into next year as well. And of course, beyond. Um, we have been doing a bit of work around board member continuity, which essentially means making sure that um, we've got the right expertise in the board as people roll off over time as they're term limited. Um, so nothing too magical there, but making sure we have sufficient coverage. And the board has always had the ability to appoint, um, I think it's up to two independent members um, outside of the nomcom process, and then they have to route in through the nomcom process if they wanna continue after a certain period. Um, and we're considering that as well to make sure that we've got a, the adequate skills coverage um, when certain folks roll off the board. Um, and of course, uh, I think, you know, Glenn Dean will be speaking later about the trust, um, maybe, I don't know, um, right after me, uh, as usual. Um, we gave final feedback to the trust on their proposed structure, which they're working hard on, and Glenn will tell you all about that. But, um, you know, I think we had a good uh, outcome there, and we've got a breakfast meeting tomorrow morning with them. Uh, we had a couple of community con uh, consultations, one um, on venue selection and another on the uh, administrative uh, strategic plan, which I think is still open for comment for about um, another few days, I think until the 13th or something like that, yeah. Um, and we continue to have discussions with ISOC. So when we began as the LLC, we struck a multi-year agreement with the Internet Society that had two components. Uh, support for operational funding, so to keep meetings going and those kinds of things, um, as well as a matching program for um, grants that other organizations might make to us. And so there are two things going on with respect to that. One is, as we look to that expiring a few years in the future, how can we revise that so that we have an operational support program in place, particularly post-COVID as we've recognized some of our costs have increased. Um, and making sure that you know we don't have to uh, dramatically change the, the way that we charge um, you know our uh, attendees, and then secondarily, um, the matching program is going to change a little bit. Uh, we're sorting out the agreement now, but in essence, some of that relates back to some of the changes that have happened recently from a staffing standpoint at ISOC. Um, I'm sure Andrew's talked about it on a number of lists. Um, and some of that relates to things related to taxes and nonprofits and the important public support tests that nonprofits have to pass. Um, so we're, we're working closely to make sure, um, you know, we can help to the extent that we can. So a lot of work to go there. Um, but those are, those are important things because we're obviously a key part or, uh, you know, key aspect of what ISOC's mission is. Um, and we want to make sure that we've got a multi-year agreement in place that, you know, goes long into the future 
uh, to provide that you know, strategic funding stability for us. And then finally, um, we had a readout at the last board meeting um, about the recent report on the experience of women in the ITF. And uh, we've got a follow-up discussion set for our next board meeting to see if there are any um, actions or, or things that we need to do as a board as a result of that. Um, you know, maybe there are, maybe there aren't. That's a discussion we'll have next week. And that's it on this topic. Um, these are the normal board meetings. I'll once again say we hardly ever have anyone come to a board meeting. Um, if you ever have any questions, uh, if you're curious about any of these issues, or if you want to challenge us about something, what have you, come to a meeting or send us an email or find us on Slack if, you're, um, if you have access to that. Lots of ways to get in touch with us. Um, in terms of the operating budget, um, this is sort of where we stand. And these are always difficult because it's sort of what happened directly after a meeting. You know, we've got these three big meetings every year, which means we have these, this really lumpy spending pattern and really lumpy uh, income pattern. Um, but at the moment, I, I mean, first and foremost, I would say put aside the investments. You know, we're not actively selling investments. We put the money away for years and you see what happens to the stock market. There's interest rates going up, the stock market goes up and down. These are sort of paper gains and losses. Um, so it's not like we're you know, having a big party like we made some uh, you know, great uh, decision here. We're sort of at the whims of the market to some extent. Um, but in any case, in terms of things we can control, revenue and expenses, capital investment, um, the primary thing is that, you know, capital investments trending a little bit lower. Um, I think as I looked at the September one, it was a bit lower as we project forward to the future. Um, but, you know, we're, we'll, we'll come in close to budget. Um, everything seems uh, on track reasonably at this point. And uh, as I said, you know, lots of ways to get in touch with us. Um, email, um, you know, admin discuss is uh, always a good one if you want uh, the community to chime in as well. And we'll certainly have uh, questions later on. So that's it. Thank you very much. Glenn, you're up. Next victim. Hi, everyone. I'm Glenn Neen, and I'm the chair of the ITF Trust. Uh, there are five trustees. Uh, several are selected by the NOMCON process. One is appointed by the ISG, and one is appointed by uh, the ISOC Board of Trustees. What is the ITF Trust? I always talk to this slide, because um, a lot of people go, we develop standards. What are these guys doing with copyrights? We hold uh, the IPR, copyrights, trademarks, and a bunch of other assets like cyber licenses for the ITF and other parts of the internet community. Uh, we protect them, keep them safe, so that we uh, here at the ITF and other places can continue to freely use them. So that's what we do, we protect things. So we license things. Since we last met, we've issued zero direct licenses and we've had zero direct license requests. Now that may seem like we're not doing anything. That's kind of a goofy number. Let me explain a little bit. Uh, we have a built-in licensing scheme for all the RFCs and all the contributions made to the ITF that says, hey, you don't need to come negotiate a license with us. You can just use it to do your work at the ITF. And if you did an RFC, you want to take that RFC and reproduce it without editing it or modifying it, you can just do it. You don't need to negotiate a separate license. So the beauty of that scheme is that we don't have to write licenses to every one of you and everybody that wants to use the work of the ITF they can just use it. It's a beautiful model, and the trust is at the heart of that. So we didn't do anything special last uh, quarter, and that's a good thing. So the big thing we've been working on, and I've talked about this for the last few uh, meetings, is the restructuring of the trust. We are currently a Virginia trust, and we are restructuring uh, for a bunch of reasons, which we've talked about before, to a uh, Delaware not-for-profit corporation. The great news is, last time I came to talk to you, uh, we were on this hold where we were waiting for uh, approval from the IRS in the US, because we're a US entity, uh, to become a full legitimate nonprofit. We have been approved by the IRS. We are now a, a nonprofit 501c3. That's the new corporation. The current trust, of course, already was a 501c3. But now this means that we can proceed with the next phase of the operation, 
which is transferring the assets from the current trust, this is the RFC copyright, uh, all that kind of stuff, transfer those assets over to the new corporation and have the corporation own them and run them and basically become the, what we call the ITF trust, so, but it's gonna be a different legal entity. So, but from what you guys know of the, as the ITF trust, the five trustees, they're all gonna stay the same. And you're all gonna be able to keep using all the materials you already have. So if you wanna know more, hit me up in the hallway, but it's really boring. But the good news is we're near the end. And to that point, we anticipate that the current ITF Virginia Trust, the plan is to have it shut down and said good night after serving us uh, for very well for many years uh, by the end of 2024. If you want to come talk to us, we have office hours uh, tomorrow from 2.30 to 3 p.m. Uh, leap in two. Uh, one thing I want to bring to your attention, and Jason sort of mentioned a little bit, uh, we did the, you know, we have a new corporation. Corporations have to have bylaws. And, you know, these are the rules of the road for how you operate the corporation. When we created the corporation last December, we uh, had a set of bylaws that were entirely based off how the current trust operates. When we spent some time talking with other parties, in particular the LLC, and with the various attorneys, we said, hey, we can make this better. And so one of the things we have done is the following. In order so that there is a control point so that you couldn't have a rogue set of board trustees go off and do crazy stuff, the process we've put in place is a proposed process, and we're not going to vote on this as trustees to approve it yet, but we're put into the new bylaws that we're proposing that there will be a 60-day notice period before any modifications are made to the bylaws. So how this will work, and by the way, uh, we're gonna try this one out, even though we haven't approved this, we're gonna try to follow this process for the change itself, is we're gonna post it. It's already posted on the trust website. If you go there today, you can see it. Uh, and we're also gonna send out notices. So I'm gonna send a notice out to the NOMCOM chair, and I'm gonna send it to Lars and various other places that appoint the trustees and say, hey, we're gonna do a change to the bylaws. The clock is ticking. 60 days from now, we're gonna vote. And uh, they may or may not get adopted, we wanted to let you know in case you had a problem with it. So that's gonna kick, kick off tomorrow. So NOMCOM, uh, when you get a note from me, I, it's not advice and I'm not trying to get a new position. You read it, read the bylaws, but you need to do nothing else. Anyways, they are right there. You can all go take a look at them yourselves. Uh, the areas in the bylaws that have changed are highlighted in green. So we did the red lines in green. We're a little crazy. We really mixed it up in the trust. If you wanna get in touch with us, email's there, the trust website's there. And we're all, or several of us are on here this week, so hit us up on the hallway. Thanks. Right, is uh, Rifat here? Great, so this is always a sad part. We've been around as an organization for, for 40 years almost. I think uh, 2026 will actually be our 40th anniversary. Um, and that means we have participants that have been around for a long time. and. Uh, some of them sadly pass away, and that happened uh, since the last ITF. And Rifat's going to say a few words about one of them. Oh, is it? Oh, there you go. Okay. Buongiorno, everyone, and welcome. That's how Vittorio used to start his, his talk or, or presentations. But he had... Um, a really musical Italian accent, so I'm sure I butchered that. Uh, Vittorio was a, a really I, I, a digital identity guru with a very long history and experience in the identity space. He was, um, because of that beautiful hair that, that you see here, he, he was an icon also in the, in the identity community. And in addition to that, he was a hair product expert uh, because of that beautiful hair. Unfortunately, I didn't um, benefit from that expertise. <laughs> um, Vittorio was an author. He written uh, a number of um, books in the identity space. Um, he also published two um, RFCs with the, um, with the author group. The last one actually was in September. Um, and he was really looking forward to seeing that published before uh, he passed. 
And luckily it was, it was published before he, his passing and he was really happy to see this. Um, he was also a, an amazing educator. He, he knew how to make the topic of digital identity accessible to many people. Um, and, and he has tons of uh, uh, videos on, uh, um, on uh, Auth0's uh, website. He used to work with Auth0 um, recently. And, and, and he also hosted a, a podcast uh, called I Identity Unlocked and get, uh, sharing his knowledge with, with everyone that, that's interested in that space. Uh, Vittorio was a, m a mentor, he was uh, a colleague, and he was a friend, a, a friend to me and to many people here uh, at the OAuth work group. Um, we miss him, and uh, rest in peace, my friend. We miss you. Thank you. We're going to do a brief moment of silence uh, for Vittorio. Thank you. Next up, we have the open mics. Do we make it almost? Oh, yeah, we did. So we have an hour for open mic. Uh, we have three open mics coming up, so roughly 20 minutes uh, per group. Uh, the IAB is uh, first. If you come up to the stage, please. Um, and uh, if you want to ask a question, please remember to use the Meet Echo queue to get in queue. Um, and uh, that way we can also have participants from remote land uh, join in the discussion. Thank you. Okay, I'm back here, but um, we also will have an introduction round for the rest of the IAB. We start here. Colin Jennings. Uh, Chris Wood, IAB. David Skenazi, IAB. Mallory Nuttall, IAB. Tommy Polly, IAB. Lars Eggert, IETF Chair. Mia Kulevind, IAB Chair, still. Suresh Krishnan, IAB member, still. Dhruv Todi, IAB. Colin Perkins, IRTF chair. Wes Herdiker, member. Tino, IAB. Okay, great that you all said that you're on the IAB. <laughs> it is why we're here. Oh, sorry, yes. We, <laughs> I'm not used to remote anymore already. Please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, this is Alvaro Rutana, and uh, I am also on the IAB. Hello, Jian Khan Yao, IAB. Thank you. Both Jian Khan and Alvaro couldn't be here last minute, but thank you for joining remotely. And we have time for questions, apparently. Please don't all rush to the mics at the same time. <laughs> so you're all absolutely happy about what we're doing, right? You can also say good things at the mic. <laughs> it's not a problem. <laughs> no, I'm just, <laughs> just confirming to make sure I understand the feedback correctly. No, okay, then we are done. Thank you very much. Next up is the LLC. And as somebody who's on all of these open mics, I'm getting nervous for the last one. But <laughs> we have too much time available for the ISG. But... Uh... I'm sure we, I'm sure we find something to fill it with. Do I see any queue? Is anybody in the queue? I don't think so. Oh, down in there? Okay. Okay. Any questions? Oh, we have to do it. I thought we uh, didn't. Never mind. Go ahead. Sean Please. Turner. I'm on the LLC board. Last I got ITF chair. I'm trying to use all the time, Jason. Uh -huh. Jason Livingood. Miriam Kuna. Jay Daly, ITF executive director. I 
and Joe Creed's board member. Got it. All right. So we have Rich in the queue first. Had to figure out if you were here in person or virtual. I think the icon changes. Okay. Um, Rich Sauls Akamai, maybe this will take all the time. Uh, I want <laughs> No, it, it shouldn't. Um, I want to, I don't know who is responsible because I've heard different conflicting stories, but I want to thank whoever is responsible. That's probably some of the people up there for the best improvement to the quality of life at an IETF meeting, which is having real coffee. <laughs> um, and <laughs> also, I'm a little worried that there was an implication that Brisbane wasn't going to have it. No, I think the opposite. I think Jay was suggesting it should be brilliant, right? The, the, the point is that in New Zealand and Australia, all of the coffee is good. Yeah, well, you do you not know, need you're, to panic. You're, this is, this um, is. Bit, well, actually, not true. There are, there are some Starbucks there. Uh, I can say that because I'll never be a sponsor of ours. Well, um, see, but if you see someone go into them, then they are a tourist. Well, yeah, see, this is why this will take the whole time because, you know, you're not an unbiased observer, right? But anyhow, seriously, thank, thanks for changing it. This is the best thing to happen since we had enough cookies. Uh, thanks. I do wonder if the key question is, is it more important to have good coffee or good cookies? Is that? Uh, oh, I do hum, yeah. It could be an angry hum. Uh, Abdul Salam, you are next. Yes. Uh... I will go for the cookies, actually. <laughs> but uh, uh, I have a question uh, regarding the uh, LLC, and I agree with the first uh, uh, question, uh, the first comment that uh, uh, there is improvement uh, actually in IETF. Uh, and uh, thank you for uh, the, the, uh, the work uh, you've done. Uh, but my question is, uh, as we listen to the th the, the trust. Uh, who was sp spoken about the trust as if there is like a procedure or uh, a way of uh, the way uh, the, the, they do the work or the, they made some kind of, uh, 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 you know, like uh, uh, points or let's say the way they do their work or the way how do they uh, work as a team. So is there something like that? Because maybe I'm not aware. This is like a question for me. Uh, maybe there's already a procedure uh, you, you can just answer for me. Thank you. What procedure for uh, changing bylaws? Well, like a procedure for consulting on bylaws changes or something? I'm not sure I understand the question. No, the, I mean the way of, uh, of your work or the, uh, let's say your uh, objectives and uh, how you target your how do you, how do you target? As you said before, you had some uh, financial statements uh, it needed some kind of correction, and you had help from I, th I think you you named Debbie or uh, some you know in, in financial companies I worked with before. They have you know, some of uh, financial steps they have to go through. Uh, so. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, like they have uh, somebody to audit, somebody to do this stuff, somebody, it's, uh, 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 it's uh, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. simple uh, steps. Yeah, okay. yeah, we, we, so we have um, a few things in that respect. Um, obviously, we have, um, you know, Sean and then the board that review the financial statements and approve them. At the end of the year, um, when we close our books, those get audited. Um, and they also have to get reviewed and approved by the Internet Society. Um, so there's a bunch of sort of checks and balances along the way for making sure that everything's accurate, um, appropriately accounted for, et cetera. Thanks. Um, Andrew is next in the queue. Uh, he is. Um, I'm Andrew Sullivan, and I have my Internet Society president and CEO hat on, although it is invisible. Um, I. I there are two things I want to. I got up here to say. The first is I, I really want to thank the LLC board and Jay for the work that's gone on for the la over the last year about financial results. We had some difficulty over the past year uh, with some of the numbers not coming when we needed them, and of course we have to file with the IRS, and that makes our lives harder. So I really appreciate the improvement there. Thank you very very much, um, and please keep it up. 
Um, the other reason I'm up here is uh, not actually for you, but to acknowledge uh, Martin, who was up earlier uh, from the NOMCOM, because uh, every year I get the happy uh, job of appointing the NOMCOM chair, uh, and I go around and beat all of you until one of you says, yes, please. Um, uh, and uh, this year, um, I, you know, I did have uh, the same difficulty I always do, but, you know, Martin um, stood up, and then it turned out this was a much more difficult uh, one than even normal. So I really, I want to acknowledge, you know, Martin was very kind to acknowledge everybody else's work, but I think he's done, um, you know, a lot, and thank you very much, Martin. John, you are next. Yes, I, I'm John Levine. <clears throat> and I guess I'm going to do the equivalent of I haven't read the draft, but I have an opinion about it anyway. Uh, <laughs> and with, um, I noticed that your uh, investment results were about up about 15%, which is not bad for this year. But I understand, but I guess I have two sort of related questions. I understand the investments are partly reserved, like in case it's another ep epidemic, and, yeah. which presumably is, is managed for, to preserve cash. And the other is an endowment, which is forever, which is managed to, mm -hmm. for over, overall return. So I'm wondering, the, so the questions are, what's the breakdown between those two parts? Are the investment policies different? And how's the endowment doing? Yeah, the investment policies are definitely different. And I think you can find that on the website. Yeah, we have four of them, actually, as it turns out. So relatively, like, the split between what's in the endowment, I think, is relatively well publicized it's actually like the smaller of the percentages at this point because it, again it's it's the smaller one that's that started out with you people donating hundreds of dollars and then a couple yeah, more I, from I, Aaron I, I a couple put more. in my 500 bucks so yeah right okay. so like again thank you for your donations um and then the additional funds that we've gotten from Aaron and Rife and um I think Lackman gave us some money and then as well as the matching funds that we've gotten from ITOC it's slowly growing. I do not know the numbers off the top of my head. I'll have to get it to you. It's not the bigger percentage, it's the smaller percentage. Um, what was the final question? I'll have to get the percentages to you. I know that. Yeah, as, yeah, with, oh, yeah, basically, what's the split? And I, I, know you, I know you've been going out and rounding up money for the endowment. Like, how's that going? Uh, slowly. slowly. Yeah, but we did get matching funds, and obviously it gets into the um, it gets immediately deposited into our you know, account. And the nice thing is that we've just got a procedure for like, what are we gonna do with it? Well, we set up the procedure, it gets invested. So there's kind of like a low delay from basically me responding to an email to get it invested appropriately. And depending on the amount, we figure out how to tranche in um, so that you don't spend it all at once. You can kind of spread it out, you know, dollar cost, dollar cost averaging in. And so that's kind of yeah. the plan. I, 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 I presume that's all on the, like the policies are on the website somewhere. Yeah, yeah. okay. It's all there. And it, yeah. as you would imagine, you know, the funds that we need access to on sort of a regular rolling basis, you know, for like continuity are going to be capital preservation focused, right? right. Yeah. Not taking risk with it. Yeah. You know, yeah. others are going to be, um, you know, more focused on growth because they're long-term, you know, measured yeah. in no, years no, and I, decades. I, 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 yeah, I, I know you know. Yeah, well, I, but, I asked because, because a... a, a <clears throat> Another organization we all know with an, with an acronym that also starts with I can't tell the difference between the two. So yeah. I'm glad that you can't. Yeah, no. And, you know, as we all know, like interest rates are a thing again, right? So yeah. even your capital preservation now has some interest instead of zero. Well, you know, yeah. since you're making all that interest, we're looking forward to having the registration fees go down. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. we can have that discussion later. All right. Um, <laughs> I see Mark uh, Nottingham in the queue. There he is. Hi. Um, I didn't have anything I felt strongly about, and then Jay starts making assertions about the quality of coffee in Queensland, so I <laughs> got very emotional for a moment. Um, I wanted to actually talk exactly about that, about the registration fees. Um, as we all know, they've become quite high. Um, I think for, for some people who might want to participate in this work, they're prohibitive, especially if they don't come from a, a Western country. Uh, and whilst we have the waivers, those are somewhat opaque in how they operate. I think arguably you could say there's a stigma associated with them. So I'm wondering, uh, uh, as an update, what you're thinking about the meeting fees? Uh, are, are you seeing that they're being exclusive or exclusionary in the work? Are we looking at bringing them down? Are you looking at other strategies to, to mitigate the effects that they might have? Yeah, so first maybe let's um, double click on waivers, which I think is your domain. I, what are the numbers looking like this meeting in the last few? So we're, Colin and I, as the, the, the chairs, sorry, of the sure. two people, so, so we, we each have a discretionary budget, um, and it's not terribly large, and, and so 
the, the largest part of mine, and I think also the largest part, largest part of Collins goes towards paying these waivers. Um, so each of us sort of set aside money for 10 waivers out of that. And I think we even increased the discretionary budgets to be able to do that. And I think they pretty much got maximized out. Um, and Colin and I have a discussion because sometimes it's not always clear when somebody applies for a waiver. Um, we know with academically focused participants, uh, Colin is usually the person to pick that up. Everybody else, it's me. And I, and I personally try to find people who are either local to the venue or um, are coming here cheaply from, from nearby um, and they're staying, you know, in, not at the hotel, but basically where that is really sort of the, the largest expense for them. And they are sort of somehow economically in distress. Right? And, and what exactly that means is always a case-to-case -case decision. And the, the gray area, as you might imagine, is huge. And, and I think everybody that asks for a waiver, I would be happy to give them one. But at some point, we have a financial barrier. Um, we are in discussions with you know, people that might give us money for the endowment that come maybe with a regional background. Um, that would um, maybe donate a large amount of money to the endowment, um, but would like to see some sort of effect in the region happening. And that might be, you know, a, a travel waiver program or something where, you know, there's a story where the donation to the endowment increases participation for the region. Um, and we're trying to like, build those sort of things out into maybe a program, but this, those discussions are still uh, underway. But the thing is, we cannot do, for example, what ICANN's doing and pay hundreds of people to come to the meetings because otherwise our budget would like double. Yeah, that, that said, um, I think, you know, we have a new process that we can revise the meeting fee annually so that it can be adjusted more to normal cost of living types of things. But I, we would love for it to be dramatically lower or even non-existent. Um, that would be the ultimate thing, but you know, we need to get big blocks of money to do that. Um, there are a few places where you know, we know that, that are sort of in the community that we can get those things. But even if we think about, like, you know, take the example of the Internet Society, for example, you know, they couldn't give us you know, every dollar that came from PIR. You know, there are obviously tax accounting problems from a, a public uh, you know, support test standpoint. I can you know, have a big uh, foundation to give out grants, but I don't know that they've like, yet finalized the process around how that's even gonna work or that they're ready to start giving those things. Um, so we have a number of things that we wanna do and that's you know, a pretty big focus of the board um, at the moment and for the next you know, few months into next year is you know, where can we go to raise more money so that you know, the rate of that growth can, if not slow, stop, um, maybe decline, um, you know, we would really like that to be um, a de minimis cost. Okay. Uh, I'll yeah, just, Jay, do you want to say something yeah. else? Yeah. So uh, a couple of things, Mark. Firstly, we do everything possible to make it clear to people the way that the online fee waiver process works is no questions asked. Um, so we do everything possible to avoid that, um, that dignity issue or other things uh, for people there. Um, it, so um, and it's difficult to see, and if you have any ideas for improvement, how we could do that without effectively, you know, um, uh, significantly undermining ordinary sales, then please let us know about that. But that's the, the dilemma we're in there. Um, the, the, the one important thing to note about the ITF is that this is the only point at which you need to pay to interact, and then we do whatever possible to allow people to interact without doing it. Everything the people who go to other SDOs tell me is that this is one of the lowest cost SDOs to be engaged with when you look at all those other considerations put together. Now, that is, we, we do not receive money through anything else other than donations. Um, we can't, you know, be in a process where we have a, 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 an ongoing deficit. We run our meetings as close as we can to neutral. Um, for you know, a, a year, we probably ran them under, and we're getting to the stage where we're just about break even now. We should hopefully be publishing meeting budgets for last year, proper ones now, like that. But if you take a meeting like this, where we don't have a meeting host, that's a $360,000 hole immediately. Um, it's made up by the fact that we have probably at least 150 to 200 people more than we were expecting on site. So that you know, could be close to 100,000 or more dollars there, um, we take off tax and stuff. So, you know, it, it, it gets better, but it, it, 
it, we have to make some various different trade-offs here. And what we think we're doing is something reasonable, putting all of that together. Mm -hmm. It's been discussed with the community in lots of different ways. So, I, I mean, the board can answer on the long-term trajectory of this, of where we want to go. But at the short term, I don't think there's anything sure. more can be done there. Well, I'm well aware you have to balance the budget, uh, but, but you use the word trade-offs, and I think that's an interesting way to look at it. So, for example, Lars talked about sponsorships. Well, we have diversity and inclusion sponsors. Is any of that money going towards this cause, for example? You, that's what pays for the fee waivers. Absolutely. Ten? I, I heard that there were ten for each of the... No, 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 for the online fee waivers as well. I see. For, for those okay. things. So, um, and it, there are... Um, some people do give us money for grants as well. For, okay. um, people I, I just to expect come. it to be a That's larger small. component. Yeah. The other thing I'd suggest you, you maybe look into is other organizations index uh, the fees based upon where someone's coming from and is the, the economic status of that place. So mm -hmm. me as a person from a relatively rich place, I would be happy paying more than I pay now, even though it's a lot, if I knew that other folks could pay less. Hmm. Okay. The only other thing I want to add, I should, probably shouldn't say this, like, but like, you know, it's hotel costs, right? <laughs> Things are getting more expensive. And some of the requirements we have on picking a hotel mean that we pick a big place that is more expensive. So one of the reasons why we're doing the meeting venue kind of, you know, cycle and looking through and seeing what our requirements are would allow us to pick smaller hotels in other cities that maybe are a little harder to get to that maybe are a little cheaper. So, you know, we're not coming back here for a long time because it's getting more expensive. There's other places like, for example, in the US that we looked at where the hotel costs are astronomical. So unfortunately, some of the costs that we have to run the meetings come from meeting fees. And so that's unfortunately how we have to get some of the money. But I get your point that and there's other things we can look yeah, at. Yeah, and thank you for the suggestion and wherever Michelle is, can you make sure it's on our agenda uh, to talk about at our meeting next week? Thank you. Uh, we have uh, Corinne Kath next. Hi, uh, Karen Kath, uh, University of Delft. As one of these very sad academics that uh, Lars just mentioned, for whom it's very expensive to, to get here, I really appreciate the comments that Mark just made, especially so because I come from a place that relatively has, has the money to do these kind of things, but there is a real need there, and it's, it's nice to see that the community is recognizing that. Um, I had a question that's slightly separate to this, which was around the investments that the IETF has and where those are placed. And mostly because I know that there is a large community here either working on sustainability or questions of anti-censorship or I think the workshop was bias. Um, and I was wondering if you've given any thought to how these investments are placed and if there is space there to, for instance, think about how can we make sure that whatever we invest the IETF money in is for instance, sustainable companies and not not, not companies trying to break encryption algorithms or uh, <laughs> let's leave what, one you know? aside for now i i guess not shell to right. bring one that's close to home <laughs> all right so we do have an esg investing strategy which some people love and some people hate but basically that is, is where we go and so we are not at the level of picking individual stocks so there's a screen that they run over to try to make sure that they have like you know, they're inclusive and those kind of things and that there is some component of it. Is it our full component? No. Do we overly lay on and say like company X we'll never invest in? No. Just, we don't get to that level. But there's a middle way there, right? There, yeah, that's there exactly. Are, and that's yeah. where I think we kind of are, yeah. Because yeah. there are these kind of ESGs that also offer fully sustainable options. Just putting it out there yeah. as I know that this is a thing for the community and this is an easy way to make money go towards that goal. Yeah. Thank you. Jim? Uh, I hope this is the right section of the meeting to make this comment, but uh, at the opening reception, it seemed really crowded in that room. And the room seemed smaller than it had been at, at some receptions previously. Uh, COVID isn't entirely behind us. And part of it also is just that, you know, a lot of us are not used to being around crowds of people as a result of that. I was wondering if there were First of all, had that been noticed? And uh, second of all, uh, are there plans to try and make sure that we have uh, uh, somewhat more space uh, in, in future meetings? We can certainly take that on board, yes, Jim. All right, next up we've got, uh, looks like Mike Bishop online. Oh, there he is. 
I had a question about the online fee waivers. I remember last time around, it was a bit of a discussion around why we budget for the fee waivers when the incremental cost is, is negligible, smaller anyway. Um, I'm not trying to reopen that piece of it, but I noticed that there was also an option to sign in as a guest speaker for a working group. Um, and I'm wondering if you could speak to the distinction between those two um, and do we also budget for those or do we treat that as just cost of running the ITF? The budgeting question is one for Jay. The, the, so the guest passes are basically um, an experiment because we, we kept having um, people that were invited to sessions, many of them newcomers, remote participants, and they did not understand they needed to make a data tracker account or register and take a fee waiver. And so they basically showed up at, at 9 a.m. in the morning and couldn't get in. And that caused a lot of chairs, a lot of stress. And, and it also caused a lot of secretariat stress and meet stress and so on. And so we created um, this guest pass code option where you can basically for a, a one-off thing, get, get quickly get a code for a speaker so you don't have to like postpone your meeting for a long time. Um, so that, that's where they came from. We do this for the first time in this way, and I think I guess we'd be happy to know whether they work and what some of the problems are. I noticed one problem is that I know I don't need to be in the approval loop for those uh, during the ITF week because I'm not going to do anything other than just say yes. Um, and but how their budget is the question for Jay. Yeah, so, so these um, these passes are all, uh, an interim step in a, in a, as Lars said in order to solve a problem. They're not intended to be the future step. Okay. Um, we do have a tension here. Um, everybody that comes to the ITF and participates in the ITF does so voluntarily you know, and um, supports the ITF in that way. They dedicate their time, uh, they give us some of the money, but resources and other things. So everybody is um, a contributor to the ITF, net contributor when you look at it. Um, and that's the way the ITF works. Now, there is a tension in that there are there are some people who believe that guest speakers who come just for one session and who come and um, uh, you know just do that are a, a, an even stronger net contributor than others and therefore should be able to come for free and um, uh, be allowed to, you know to do that for free. And this the, the tension here is of course is that if you start to measure the value of people's contributions, it gets very very messy, you know. Um, and that's not the necessarily the ethos that we've had now, up until now, which is that everybody contributes and does that. So, um, yes, when we have the final um, mechanism in place, we will budget for it and uh, so that we understand it as the cost it is to the organisation of providing that. Um, you're right that to a degree it is, you know, it can be seen as funny money, but it's also a, a genuine cost to the organisation in terms of opportunity and the cost of uh, infrastructure and all sorts of things. Um, as you know, we've invested heavily so that the remote experience is as good as the um, on-site experience. And um, many of the community have gone along with the process changes that have come as a result of that. So you use Meet Echo to join the queue, you know, to talk now while I'm just walking up. So, um, so it's not without cost, you know, in that sense to do those things. So, so that's the, the best answer I can give you. It will be budgeted, um, but we still have this tension around the, you know, the perceptions of value around that that need to be resolved as part of that. Yeah, I don't, I had not realized when I saw it initially that it was essentially the emergency interrupt. Yeah, so if you um, remember yeah. DOLT last time when we had a 10 minute fail on one of the chairs part on my fault, this was to fix that problem where somebody showed up okay. and was like, oh, geez. So this is the punch the button to make it work. All right. Thanks so much. Was that working group name because of you? <laughs> Sorry. Hello. Andrew? Hi, Andrew Campling, uh, 419 Consulting. Uh, one comment uh, and then a question, the, the comment. Um, in the spirit of, I think, Richard's one about the coffee being a big improvement. I think uh, Meet Echo, uh, amazing. Um, personally, I think really good tool. And uh, congratulations to the team for continuing to, to evolve that. Um, my question, though, I'd be interested to know what the LLC's board's view is on 
whether we're making any substantive progress on diversity um, in the community. Um, my sense is at best it's modest, but I don't have the data to substantiate that. So I'd really appreciate your, your thoughts on, are we actually doing anything really meaningful um, that, that's moved the, the needle? And if not, is that a focus? And do you have thoughts on what more we could do to actually make a difference? Well, it, it's certainly a focus. I think some of our survey data that we do um, post-meeting, you know, creates an opportunity to collect some data there. Um, I think the most recent data point that we had that was very qualitative was the report on the experience of women coming to IETF meetings. Um, it, uh, some sections of it make for sobering, uh, sober reading, I should say. Um, and uh, it's very interesting. Um, we continue to see behind the scenes um, certain behaviors that are, you know, less than professional um, amongst the community, and we work hard to try to help correct those things or improve them. But it's clear that there's a lot more work to do, um, and it's uh, it, it's it's on a number of fronts, and it's a strategic item, you know, that we're focused on because, in part, it relates to things that are not just the quality of the work that comes out of the organization. Um, because that, you know, heavily interacts, uh, or excuse me, relies on the social interactions that occur and the openness of those things. Um, but it relates to the, the newcomers that are willing to come to the ITF, the people that decide to come back and stay, you know, how welcoming and open is that environment? How friendly is it? Um, you know, so things like some of the guides program, for example, have been helpful for some of the newcomers, but it's a, it's going to be a long process. Um, and, uh, you know, we're not alone in, tech groups for having this this challenge but you know that doesn't mean we can't do anything about it right we should be doing things about it and and we're trying to you know keep moving the ball forward we're always open to suggestions of course um but i think all of us here you know view that as a priority indeed thanks um next up is mallory Hey, Valerie Nodal. Um, just wanted to respond to your call for comments on the code thing we were just talking about, because while it happened at Dolt last time, it's been happening in my research group for a very long time. Um, and so I knew that, and I just wanted to give the feedback that it's really helpful to have it. Now, I didn't use it as an emergency parachute this time. I, in advance, had um, at least one of my speakers that I knew was going to have a challenge in getting on. So I kind of gave them the option. I was like, if you can take these five steps to register and do this, that would be ideal. Um, and in the end, they got tripped up and they then asked me to request a code. I did. I got it. I passed it on and everything worked really well. So I just wanted to say, for my use case anyway, I really appreciate this feature. Thank cool. you. All right. Thanks. And Greg next. Hi, Greg Chules, ISC. Um, as an IETF virgin, I have to say um, that um, it was very welcome having the newbies events, you know, to try and provide some kind of induction. Um, the one thing I would uh, ask is that since there's a bewildering number of things that go on here and committees and all sorts of stuff to understand, um, IETF for dummies would be really nice. IETF for dummies, yeah. yeah. IETF for dummies, okay. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to say anything? This is like kind of uh, no. I like the suggestion stick. of uh, Sean suggested idea of bananas, and <laughs> <laughs> that is also a good idea. Well, thank you, and we hope you come back. Thanks for coming. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much for your time. All right. Thank you. Okay. ISG. <laughs> this is what we're doing. All right, since you guys are already sitting, uh, let's start the introductions down with Jim. Uh, Jim Guichard, Rowdy Mady. Uh, Robilton Ops AD. Uh, Martin. Martin Duke, soon to be X Transport. 
<laughs> Andrew Austin, Routing ID. Eric Vink, Internet ID. Francesca Palombini, Art ID. Um, ITF, Lars Eggert, ITF Chair and Gen AD. Eric Klein, Int AD. Warren Kamari, The Real Ops AD. Mia Kuleman, IAB Chair. Roman Genelier, Security AD. Paul Rautas, Security AD. John Scudder, Routing Enthusiast. Murray Kucharavi, Applications Real Time. Jahid John Sharkar, soon not to be transported. <laughs> All right, uh, Michael. Hi, Michael Richardson here. So I asked some of these questions online, sort of the IAB, but um, the ISG does our, or the final, the final say on uh, session and planning and, you know, Friday afternoon and all that stuff. Um, so we had two IAB programs run at lunchtime today. And um, as someone said, I kind of call them normative sessions as opposed to informative sessions like, you know, host speaker or, you know, other things like that. Um, specifically, I think of a normative session as one that might produce an RFC that you might want to have an opinion about or something like that. So I think this is the first time we've run one of those at lunchtime. Um, and um, I just like to know the parameters of this experiment, I guess. Um, I think it's quite stressful for some people to feel uh, fear of missing out as they go and actually put nutrition in their body, uh, that they're missing something. Um, on the other hand, I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, uh, pre-ordering my lunch and having it show up or something like that uh, for that session. So um, we moved into Friday afternoons. What are the things are, what other experiments are we going to do in scheduling? And again, what are the parameters for this lunchtime right, so session? I mentioned the, the agenda pressure that, that caused us to have the Friday afternoon experiment. And you, and you notice that even with that, we ran out of space for some things, right? And, and so the, the IAB re requested um, the, the lunch slots and, and the ISG is not really involved in that anymore than saying, yeah, there's no conflict with IS, the ITF work. But I guess Miria has more um, details on what uh, the thinking is between. Yeah, I'm really excited to get a question for the IAB. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so this is not the first time actually we are doing uh, program meetings during lunch breaks. Um, but we announce it more openly, I guess that's a difference. But we will not keep it, keep doing it like this. Um, so first of all, we will not have like all the meetings, all the programs meeting all the time, blocking all the lunch slots. And then we also noticed that this is not ideal. Um, so we do kind of try to involve an experiment with how we want to run the programs. And we, will, we, we are discussing that and it will change and it will not be the same next time. So, so let me just add that, that one of the things I thought was brilliant about that doing it this way was that uh, both programs are very broad input and it, there was especially evolvability, right? Everybody should be at that meeting in some sense, right? Um, so, I mean, so that was a really brilliant thing, but, you know, as we had very little, my questions to the IAB, um, maybe you should consider some of these things should actually take this time now, okay? Um, and, you know, there's, we used to have these long into midnight plenaries with Perry Metzger doing Nixon at the back. Um, and you want really to go back great. to that? Yeah, Mark, yeah I Mark, don't know that Mark I want to go back to that, but, but, but I'm saying that, you know, the pendulum is maybe gone, you know, other way. We even had Monday morning opening plenaries at distant times past, right? Um, so th there was all sorts of things, but I'm saying is that there's a bunch of different things and I think we're, we're right. very fragmented and any attempt to bring a little bit more unity would be also good with the constraint that we have so many sessions, right? right? It's a real problem. Yeah, so, and, and plenary time specifically kills all other parallel slots, right? Of course, so Keep exactly. that in mind as you ask for it because we're already running out of space, right? So it's, it, it's, it's hard to square the circle, right? And, and so this time we, we tried the IB programs on the Tuesday. We also have some actually meetings on Thursday because we don't have a host uh, speaker session. So we, we stuck some something there. Um, but, but really, right, the, the demand for time at the ITF, especially past COVID, has gone up. And you also see the site reading, Mickey, is, Wiki is exploding with, with sessions that, you know, it's great that you're also interested in having meetings here, but it makes it difficult to pick and choose. Um, 
plenary is right. Um, two hours is already quite long. We had them with a break and all of that. So, so I'm, I'm not opposed to this actually discuss that the IAB uh, hold a technical plenary. It's, it's an option. We would need to like probably cut out a lot of the first hour and, and you all need to be okay that we're then doing that only online, right? Um, but, but we can discuss this, but we can't magically make more time available. I, I want to add one more point. So a program is not a working group and it's not supposed to be run as a working group. The program is mainly a, a venue where we want to have external expertise into the IAB and the things they're doing on the IAB from the community. Um, so there is also balance between getting this like targeted expertise or having like a broad community discussion with everybody. And we are really discussing, trying to figure out how to get this balance right. And it might be something where we report back from time to time more broadly, but then do work in other ways or whatever. So this is like, it is a process we're trying to figure out how to do it right. And I will add on behalf of the LLC, there will be a post-meeting survey to catch <laughs> conflicts, either this one or for everyone that will be able to aggregate and get a sense for what the community would like. Thank you, Pete. Uh, so this is Pete Resnick. To continue that uh, thread, uh, RSWG is the one that's meeting tomorrow at noon. Um, there is some discussion about whether um, groups, now RSWG like the IAB stuff is not an IETF thing, but even gen area, gen dispatch, things which are very cross area, um, having those meetings during lunch, having them during breakfast, um, maybe having them in the evenings. Um, if you want to have cross area participation, which is kind of required for some of these, especially those people up there are gonna be stuck anytime there's any conflict. Anytime anything else meets, the ADs have to go cover their own meetings. They can't go to these general area meetings. So I think it's definitely worth considering as a broader point. And, and I think it's worth doing to get some space where maybe it's not as, exactly as pleasant to have to eat your lunch while you're doing these things, but it's okay. I will point out that a, that a few years back, we had the exact opposite discussion and the community wanted way more site meeting time and way more time that wasn't taken by formal sessions, right? So there's a pendulum here and it keeps going this way and that way, um, which doesn't mean that we can't do anything sensible now. Maybe, you know, the demand has shifted for what we need, but, you know, there's, there's only so many things we can do within the constraints of the space and the time we have. Daniel. This is Daniel Con gilmore uh, Yeah, I was up, coming up to nudge the pendulum in the opposite direction as well. Um, please do not over schedule all of our lunch times. One of the advantages and one of the reasons why it's worthwhile to come to the meeting in person is because you actually manage to find people who are here who have been thinking about the same thing and you can have a little brainstorming session either before a meeting or after a meeting. And you know, the hallway track is a really important track. So please don't over schedule. Rahul. Hey, uh, I'm Rahul. Uh, I'm one of the beneficiaries of the Travel Grant Program. Thank you very much for having me here. Uh, it's been a, I've had a very good time here. However, coming here was a nightmare. And it seems to me all the interventions that happen uh, are reactive and not proactive. So there is a failure to understand what are the barriers to entry for people from uh, coming from uh, developing countries. Uh, I had given up three weeks ago. Had it not been for Dhruv here, who kept encouraging me, I would not have come here. So, I mean, uh, this should be uh, please looked into because there are many more people who would like to participate here, but they just won't have the opportunity if things are managed in the way they are currently. Thank, Thank you. you. So the travel grants are given out by the IRTF and Colin is uh, down there on the floor. Yeah, hi, uh, Colin Perkins. Um, yeah, th this is always a difficult challenge. Um, we, we have been running this travel grant program for a while. Um, we, we learn, uh, I, think, I think, something new every time we run it and some new, new challenge every time we try and run it. Um, it's certainly something we're trying to improve. Uh, I'm meeting with Alexa and the, the rest, some of the rest of the people from the Secretariat on Friday to, to discuss how we can uh, try and improve some things for next time. Um, 
if there is feedback on what worked well and what didn't work well, um, please do send it to us. Uh, we will do what we can to improve it in future. But it's a learning process, and uh, you know, we're, we're doing the best we can. Yeah. And I guess you have talked or are going to talk. Uh, yeah, we, we spoke briefly. Okay, great. Week, so, and I, I'm happy to chat further. Yeah. Sorry you had a hard time getting here. Thanks for coming anyway. Spencer. Yeah, uh, thank you. I I just want I just wanted to say on the on the topic of scheduling, uh, the, the the side meetings seem to be you know the side meeting slots seem to be registered side meeting slots seem to be pretty uh, much back to back uh, all week you know, all week long you know with basically all the available space in use. And one of the, and that's cool. Uh, I remember when the ISG started, you know, making it easier for people to find each other to schedule side meetings uh, and providing spaces for them. So that's cool. But I think it would, I think it would be uh, a reasonable question to ask. Um, you know, we, I participate in two or three working groups that do a significant amount of their meeting time uh, in interim meetings during the you know during during the time between ITF meetings. I wonder what can I wonder what can, could be done to improve the ability of people to uh, schedule interim side meetings in a more formal way than just me reaching out to people that I know, but uh, uh, but. You know, basically, you know, without having to use up IETF meeting week time. Uh, I was in a very important side meeting uh, this, you know, this week, and uh, ended up having to skip out of a somewhat less important uh, working group meeting this week. Uh, the other thing is that uh, the thing with side meetings is kind of like for hot RFC talks where, you know, there's not really anybody in charge of being the gatekeeper uh, for, you know, for them. Uh, and one of the things just to, to, for the community to be aware is it's pretty easy for people to schedule a side meeting, you know, because these things tend to be somewhat at the last meeting without realizing that someone else who's working in a similar topic area with different, you know, with a different name uh, for the topic area, you know, it's like these people should be talking to each other, but they're, they're you know, it, like I said, just for the community to be aware of that. Um, I don't, you know, I don't know if it's possible to open up the uh, help help me out here. We we've just done the we've just changed the format of the wiki. To be, uh, you know, like a, there's a top and a bottom part, but uh, perhaps, perhaps there's a way to uh, basically saying I'm planning on a side meeting at this at this ITF, um, and I don't know when it will be, and I don't, you know, and I don't know uh, what room it will be in, and things like that. Yeah, so but, uh one thing we could do is certainly we could we could start a mailing list for site meeting conveners that they can use to talk to each other because that I don't think we currently have. But there is the tussle that it's for, for the IETF as an organization. Um, we were more involved in uh, deconflicting site meetings because a while ago you needed actually right. area, area director approval to, to get a room right. for a site meeting. And, and that was not working because people were reporting that an AD had approved the site meeting on this topic as if that was some sort of endorsement other than just right. basically saying, yeah, that room is empty, go take it. And, and that caused right. a lot of problems because that was reported out as some sort of IETF endorsement. And, and we really need to be careful to not do something that, that recreates that problem. But one thing we could try I, I, is basically a mailing list on, for site meeting organizers to talk to each other. That, and that, that 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 would be that would be another really good uh, suggestion. And one thing I'm thinking about is uh, it's pretty easy for me to set up a side meeting on my own 
you know, because I've got a, I've got a Zoom account, uh, you know, that would accommodate up to a hundred people, which is more than I would ever have in any meeting. But uh, I saw that the I, I saw that the IETF is uh, was providing WebEx uh, access for side meetings. Was this the first IETF when that's that's happened? No, we've done this for a while, and also the meeting oh, hall. Really? So we we. We try to make things available that make it easier to have the side meeting so that the, it's not such a heavy lift yeah. to run it in the room. Yeah. But we, we do try and, and do things that are that can't be construed as any sort of endorsement by the ITF. Yeah. Okay, so we'll try to make so, this. Uh, we're going to put it on the wiki for next meeting. Thank you. Cool. Uh, th th thank you, and I'll stop talking. Thank you. Andrew. Hi, uh, Andrew Campling. Uh, just on the side meeting, is it? Uh, I have to say, I think the kit in the side meeting rooms is a big improvement. So thank you to whoever arranged that. That was really good. Um, on a less serious note, I simply want to come to the mic to congratulate uh, Warren for raising the sartorial bar of the uh, ISG. So thank you. And thank you to the secretariat. Um, me the hats. What's different? <laughs> <laughs> Corinne. Hi, uh, Corinne Kant of the University of Delft. Just wanted to echo what just uh, was brought up again, the, the difficulties of traveling here and coming here, not only if you're from certain sectors, but also certain regions. And I wanted to mention um, a little initiative that some of us have been running because we recognized this problem maybe two, three years ago, uh, especially when it came to technologists that don't work for big corporations. And we've actually quite successfully been running a tiny travel fund for um, public interest technologists to not only come to the IETF, but also W3C and other spaces. And I'm saying this not because I think I can fund all of this room that's now staring at me, um, but because if a bunch of people working for civil society organization and academia can hack this, I think there are more creative ways that we can think about it as a community. And I'm well aware of the fact that there's not as much money as there used to be. Um, but it also doesn't take that much again. And the fact that we can do that is a good example of that. Yeah, and thanks for doing this and, and thanks for sending us people. And I, I will note that you're doing it for a particular reason and to bring in particular people, right? For the IETF to do something like that, it would put us into this awkward position that Jay outlined earlier, where we, we would need to then somehow figure out who's deserving by some metric of, of one of these grants, right? Which is in my book very hard because you know everybody makes contributions and, and they all value because they all move us forward but you know we don't have unlimited uh, resources so it's easy if if you have a purpose for the grant it's much more difficult to hand it out from an organization unless you're um, an organization with very deep pockets no i mean i fully understand that at the same time we also have difficulties because our funding is very limited right we also have a set of criteria and we have to hash it out um, not everyone who applies to us can go but at the same time, I feel you are capable of doing it because you're doing it with the fee waivers. Right? It's not entirely impossible, and I understand it's, it's difficult. But sometimes to bring in a diverse set of voices, we're going to have to do difficult things. Yeah, let, let's sort of line. Maybe there's some criteria that, that at least Colin and I can sort of uh, take a look at and see if that brings some more uh, clarity. Thank you. So um, regarding the visa difficulties, um, you know, I, I mean, certainly I think many of us can sympathize with, with the troubles that causes. And unfortunately, we have no, little to no impact on immigration systems and immigration laws. But I, I will say that Jay has been working on an effort to make it somewhat easier for us to meet in places we haven't met much in the past, countries we haven't met much in the past. And um, that's going through the gen area. There's a document there to update some RFCs to make that easier. So I don't think we're going to stop meeting in the, in the, in the, um, in the traditional countries we meet, but maybe at least sometimes we can get to places that are more accessible to more people. Uh, Jamin, Robin. Me, can yeah. I just, since oh, you want to, yeah, by the way, Jamin, be quick, Rahul. Yeah, uh, to the point that it's difficult to, uh, there are visa difficulties if decisions are made timely and documentation, et cetera, is available timely, it simplifies the process a lot. So you can do that. Also, uh, destination matters like Shenzhen is especially tough for some some reason. And it's not my first time. I've lived in Sweden for three years. Every time there was a problem. So there is a pattern to this behavior also, which 
can be learned about if you talk to enough people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, to me from Huawei. So in fact, I have these the comments on the uh, things that happens in the routing area and also the MPR's working group chair because the MPR's working group chair, Laura, was forced to be replaced and uh, I doubt the process and the reason uh, in the mailing list. I think the response ID emphasizes the deliberation and the enough consultation. But uh, I seems that the only the reason you still is to inject uh, this the new uh, opinions uh, or that is in the as the only the reason to replace the working group chair. So I think uh, can this be explained more so as to make this more apparent. Thank you. Robin. As, as, you, as I said to you, in a reply on the MPLS list regarding this, the decisions with regards to appointment and replacement of working group chairs are things that are taken with very careful deliberation. They are done in order to ensure that working groups function in the most harmonious way to find the consensus that we need to build open standards. Those decisions are very often very, very difficult to make, both on the replacement and the appointment. They require a lot of communication, a lot of which happens off list, which you're not going to go and divulge publicly because there are a lot of things that come in when those decisions are made and they are made for very careful reasons. Um, and yes, as you noticed, a working group chair was replaced. And I think that the mail that was sent um, in response to your mail gave a, as much detail um, as is appropriate because of the communication. It was not done lightly, it was, and Yes, I think that the process does say that working group chairs serve at the pleasure of the ADs. I think that that's important because I think there has to be a trust relationship between the working group chairs and the ADs. Um, and the decision was made. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all I can say about that. Okay. So my this the question is that one because you emphasize this uh, deliberation and the Consultants, consultation, and also if you think, uh, because uh, this is a very exceptional case in the shooting area, so I think, uh, I think the two options, the first option, maybe you can explain, uh, explain what's the deliberation or the consultant, consult, uh, consultation. Maybe a second option, we just uh, emphasize the outcome. So what's the careful reasons? Yeah, because I think now this is the only the reason is that uh, inject uh, this the new perspective. I don't think it's a very uh, reasonable reasons. Yeah, that's my point. Thank you, uh, Abdul Salam. So, as uh, as my comment uh, for. Uh, for the uh, ISG, uh, I, I would like also uh, to, uh, to, uh, to 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 know uh, uh, the way uh, the AD work. How do, do they work with the chairs or the working group of chairs? Is 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 there some uh, kind of clear procedure uh, as the way they replace or don't don't replace? So that that needs to be clear to to any participant. Usually we don't know, although we don't care sometimes. But if some problem happens, we may need to to know. Like the, I'm not sure what happened before for the, who, who commented before me. Actually, my question was uh, regarding uh, newcomers. Uh, newcomers, they need. Uh, I see uh, my observation or my belief that they are decreasing. They are not increasing when I 
I, I work in some working groups. So I hope that there is a strategic plan. Uh, as I heard from uh, the LLC, they are already having a plan and asking the community, what, what's your feedback on the, uh, the strategy plan? Uh, is there a strategy plan from the point of the ADs, IESG, uh, for newcomers? And uh, who are going, uh, let's say, or leaving us? As I'm not sure how, how many people are coming and going. So, so we have to have at least a strategy. This is the most important right. issue for I, uh, ITF. Thank you. So Jay is get generating data for us. Um, he did the all uh, ITF participant survey that uh, tried to ask about, you know, people for reasons for joining and leaving the organization. And we're analyzing this, and and the ISG is working together with the LLC. Um, on so LLC owns a lot of the um, meeting related um, aspects of making the newcomer experience uh, a good one and, and the ISG owns the, the technical content of that right and so, so we, we do keep working together and we, we do try to identify ways in which you can improve that um, and we're going to ask again after this meeting how did it go for the newcomers in the post meeting survey and take actions but it's a, it's a process right i think everybody in the in the organization and especially leadership is aligned that we want to have more newcomers we want to be a welcoming environment for everybody we want to make it as easy as possible to come here um real world considerations make that sometimes more difficult than, than we want to and but it, it's a process i think that everybody's committed to to go down the road on now just if there's a the clear plan or some uh, something on the list we can uh, work on together but if it's only IESG doing it, uh, I don't think newcomers, usually for me, I started in 2013. I started because of the AD was supporting me. But if I didn't get that support from AD, I will not even uh, stay for one month uh, with IETF. Right. So I so, think it's important that we, uh, the, AD, the new ADs also, they put this in, into consideration. Yeah, I wouldn't only put it on the IDs. I mean, we have a mentoring program that has tried to formalize these more ad hoc relationships that, that you benefited from um, and make them available more widely and also advertise them more widely. But I think Miria wanted to follow up. Yeah, I just wanted to ensure that like in all leadership groups, this is very high on the agenda. That's the topic we talk very often. We talked about it last Sunday. Um, and, what I, and we have a bunch of activities the EODR um, is, is working with mentors and newcomers, but I think also outreach is the point, like just going out and actually talking about the ITF so people know that, how it works and that they are aware of it. So there's like a whole bunch of things. And I do agree to the point that we need to bring a little bit more strategy into that and actually make a plan and then execute on that. And that's also something that we are discussing. Thank you. I'll, I'll just say also, I'll make a general point about the comment about sort of transparency about chair assignments. Um, without speaking about the merits of this case, which I'm not particularly familiar with, that, so, that these are essentially personnel actions and there are reasons to remove a chair that should not be disclosed in public. Right. Uh, we got three minutes and three people in the queue. So if you're in the queue, please be brief. Uh, Vesna. Yeah, I'm a, one more time from no, Fitchway. Vesna is next in queue. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Um, did, did you join the queue on the Miteco? No. No, okay. Um, all right, then let's hope we have time for you. Okay. Vesna. Uh, I'm a relative newcomer, and what I've heard about IETF is that uh, we make decisions by humming, and I haven't heard any humming yeah. until <laughs> now. Uh, <laughs> right. well, yeah. Okay, I'm going to fix this. Please hum for Vesna now. All right, there you go. We digitized the hums with the Meet Echo tool. Uh, Thank sorry you. for that. <laughs> um, all right, uh, Rudiger. Uh, yeah, I... Uh, looking at uh, mailing lists uh, when uh, working group uh, products are pushed over to IESG, uh, once in a while I did see so many changes coming out of that that I would like to uh, ask, well, okay, what is your feeling whether, uh, well, okay, less rework should be required or is 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 that something that is in general at an acceptable level so Rudiger, clearly when during the IAG evaluation the content is technically changed 
we typically run another IETF last call because we need to get a consensus on what they've changed. Now, whether it has been done all the times, I cannot guarantee, but normally it has the process, and I think all my fellow ADs are doing the same as I do. Okay, so kind of the follow-up there would be, I haven't done any statistics on this. I just remembered uh, uh, some observations. Uh, 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 is anybody running uh, statistics so we see what percentage of last recall recycling happens? So, uh, let me quickly hop in as well. I don't think we have any stats like that because a large number of the changes are things when ADs are doing review, they're purely editorial and like a huge number of like grammar issues and things like that. Nits. So I don't think you can really just do a useful thing other than reading them all. Although I would point out if people send better review documents to the IESG, there'll probably be less changes when we do that. And, um, let, let me add to that as well. Um, I actually recently sent a document back a couple of weeks ago where I felt that the, the diff was too big uh, and that I couldn't really determine anymore whether this still had working group consensus. So I actually sent it back to the working group for a short working group last call. And that's definitely, I think that what, what in general the responsible AD does after it goes through the process from when it's gone from publication requested through the pipeline. And just before sending it to the RFC editor, you have to check and see like, okay, how are these changes? Are, are there actually any um, uh, like, like must or, or should keyword change? Because that could be a single line that could be enough to send it back to the working group, right? It's not just about the bulk of the text. And the same thing happens in the O48 stage. Right, Tony. Which there is now a mailing list for. Yes, uh, Tony Lee. Hi, Tony Lee, Juniper. Um, I'd like to respond to Robin. Um, the decision that Andrew had to make was a difficult one, but I believe that it was absolutely necessary. The relevant working group has been dysfunctional for a very, very long time. And without making a change, it was going to continue in that way. And that's simply not acceptable. Uh, the decision was regrettable. I wish that there had been a better way, but I definitely support it. Thank you. Um, one more from FutureWay. Uh, NPS is uh, one of the largest group for long, for many, many years. I still remember our chair, George Swallow, when George Swallow stepped down, and then in the whole meeting room, people stand up and with respect for many, for many, many long, long time. So this is even happened many years ago. That looks like it happened yesterday. I think no, as also, I think it's a suffered IT and plus even more, is longer than George, right? I think no should also have this kind of respect from the people, at least MPLS group. From the mailing list, I can see that we just uh, kick off the law without a discuss with law. law. I think this, this is not smooth. I think from the, what I can see is not smooth. And also we don't give a chance for people to express, express respect for this, for no, which make huge contribution to the MPLS and also to the community. That's what, what I'm going to say. Thank you. So uh, I'll respond very briefly to that. Um, just, I'd like to repeat what I think it was Martin who said, um, there are personnel matters that shouldn't be talked about on the stage. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that there was actually a, a wonderful outpouring of um, uh, thanks to Loa on the MPLS mailing list after that action, which I thought was great. And I have nothing bad to say about that. Um, but I, I will disagree that there was no opportunity to express respect for Loa on the mailing list. Thank you. Thanks all. Uh, I close the queue. We're a little bit over time, but thanks for sticking around. Uh, hope we'll see all of you and your friends in Brisbane. <laughs>